Greetings from the Dark Continent, Conscious Caracal Hill, Adams Van Sail, here to shine a light on the goings-on down south. And tonight we are definitely going to be shining a light uh, on the goings-on down south. But also, I do think for many of my foreign listeners uh, or my listeners abroad that this isn't a, a topic that is restricted to South Africa. There's just a big debate going on currently in South Africa regarding it. But I don't think uh, this conversation is not going to be valuable for my American and European listeners as well. Um, this type of principles that are at play in the South African culture war, I think, are at play in your countries as well, even though your countries might treat uh, the topic of freedom of speech a bit differently or maybe even the same. Then it's a, a much better uh, case study. Um, I do apologize for my sinister lighting. I, uh, the fact is I'm sitting here in the middle of load shedding, but the, the show must go on if I uh, can't uh, move it to tomorrow night because tomorrow night load shedding isn't exactly the same time slot. So tonight we're going to make it work. Um, if for some reason uh, my light goes off, uh, I do have some, some other backups here and I'll, I'll get to that. If uh, there's anything wrong with the internet, seeing as I am on a backup internet source here as well, let me know in the chat and I can make a plan there as well. Um, joining me here tonight is someone that you will recognize many of my listeners and many of my uh, watchers here on the, the Conscious Caracal YouTube channel because he has been a guest before. Uh, it's Martin van Staden, uh, who was in a debate here with Robert Deigen uh, quite a while ago. can't remember exactly when. I think it was last year. And uh, But this tonight, it's not going to be a debate, uh, but let me just get uh, to the foundational introduction before we get to uh, the, the topic at hand. So um, Martin van Staden uh, is firstly a writer and a, po a political and policy commentator. He is a legislative and policy cons consultant at Sarkelicha, and he is pursuing a doctorate in law at the University of Pretoria. And uh, one more thing. Um, I, I hate the expression that, oh, we don't agree on everything, but uh, there's nothing that I don't think there's anyone in the world that you agree on everything with. Uh, but I have to say, me and Martin do disagree on a myriad of things. Uh, and uh, but tonight's not going to be a debate. We're not here to really put on a, a spicy debate. We're rather going to have a, a conversation on principles. And I wanted to invite Martin on uh, to discuss principles, because if there's someone out there that will stick by his guns and by his principles, if my constitutional rights are ever under threat, I know pretty much that I will bet money on the fact that Martin will be there to stand up for my for my rights, uh, even though even if it would be very, very uh, controversial or not in his favor to do so. So that's why I invited Martin on here tonight. So welcome on the show, Martin. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to get into it. All right. So just a little bit of context before we jump into specifically the the topic at hand um if you are a south african listener you might and if you've been watching my channel you would have been uh, following the uh, my content that i uploaded on the old south african flag being banned the last two videos that i uploaded was on that so if you're not up to date with that context you can always uh, go check that out but we will be getting into some of the context as well in this conversation so just briefly uh so in 2019 the old south african flag was uh, banned by court order and then uh, now it, uh, afri forum is appealing that decision again and that ban stretches to public and private um, and then also what's happening this week, uh, that happened last week, the, the appeal where AfriForum appeared in court. What's happening this week is that the oral submissions are being done for the, let me just get the title correct, because it is a mouthful, the Prevention and Combating of Hate Crimes and Hate Speech Bill. That's happening on Wednesday as well. And I know uh, Martin also has an opinion on that. So we will be getting into that. So let's get into the the meat and potatoes of this conversation and it's like i told martin before we went live it's not a topic that's all that uh edgy or on the edge of uh, political thought it actually it's something that's been uh, quite a lot has been said about it um and it's a, a topic within our political circles that has a myriad of uh, uh literature pieces of literature writing uh, and all types of uh opinions and comments on it and that is freedom of speech now Martin, let's start off with from your perspective as someone that uh, identifies as a classical liberal that has a, a very uh, detailed understanding of the tradition of classical liberalism. Uh, and something at the core of classical liberalism is definitely the principle of freedom of expression, uh, as we have mm -hmm. here in, 
South Africa protected by the Constitution. How do you understand that right, that freedom of expression that we have here in South Africa? Hmm. Yeah, so uh, as as you rightly say, uh, freedom of expression is one of the basic classical liberal uh, uh, liberties that are prized. Uh, and many would say that it's the basis of, of all uh, public freedom. Uh, so it's, it's that important. Um, so if you ask classical liberals or libertarians about um, the limits of speech, they will come back to you with one answer. There is only one limit, and that is uh, uh, threats of violence and uh, violence itself. So a uh, speech will usually only be a threat of violence uh, or expression. Um, so that's that's it. Uh, there is no no room, uh, according to the classical liberal um, lexicon, for governments to engage in the banning of offensive speech, of, of even immoral speech to, to a very large extent. That's simply not uh, on the menu as far as the legitimate function of government is concerned. And quite interestingly, South Africa's constitution comes uh, quite close to this, uh, the written constitution, not, not the applied constitution, if you want to uh, make that distinction that Professor Chris Malan always uh, makes so well. Uh, so our constitution says that you have the right to freedom of expression, uh, uh, and that includes the media freedom, press freedom, artistic uh, creativity, academic freedom, etc. Uh, and then it goes uh, uh, and lists the specific exceptions to that. Now, this is something that very few uh, legal systems or constitutional uh, statutes do around the world. The United States, for instance, doesn't say what is not protected by the constitutional uh, right to freedom of speech, uh, that the courts had to define that. And in South Africa, the courts also do that, but they do so very improperly because our constitution tells us what the limits are. And there, there are three limits. Um, uh, incitement to uh, uh, bodily harm, uh, incitement for war uh, or advocacy of war, uh, and the third one is hate speech. Um, uh, the Constitution doesn't use those words, uh, but effectively the, the third one is hate speech. Now, the Constitution doesn't criminalize those things. It just says that the government may do so uh, if, it, if it chooses. So uh, uh, constitutionally, your freedom of, of expression is... is wide open and, and almost absolute, but the government has the right to prohibit only those three things, hate speech, incitement to imminent violence, uh, and advocacy for war. Now, these are, it's an interesting mix. I'm not sure why advocacy for war is prohibited by the, uh, is, is contemplated by the South African constitution. It's, it's a very interesting addition there, but the incitement to, uh, 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 violence, that's understandable. That's uh, classical liberalism 101. You can't go around uh, threatening people's liberty, their lives, and their property. Uh, their government does have a legitimate uh, role to play, to step in and uh, uh, take action. And then hate speech, which I think the definition of is uh, in the Constitution is, is narrow. It's not as broad as the courts have made it out to be. And that's important. The, the courts have taken... Um, freedom of expression and really created it, uh, uh, put it in a straight jacket to an extent. Um, uh, in that same breath, I can say that our freedom of expression in South Africa is quite plentiful. It's uh, compared to countries like Germany, even for instance, uh, South Africa's freedom of expression is, is quite broad uh, and we, we, we are quite privileged for that. But the courts uh, have, and, and parliament, uh, the hate, the uh, the Equality Act, which I think you're also familiar with, uh, also has a prohibition on what it calls hate speech, which goes uh, beyond what the Constitution defines as hate speech. Then Parliament is busy with this hate speech bill that we're going to discuss, uh, which has a, uh, uh, which used to have a incredibly broad definition of what hate speech means, completely out of constitutional bounds. They've changed that now, so it's far closer to what the Constitution says now, but it's still problematic for various reasons. Um, and yeah, then the courts, especially the Equality Court, um, uh, it, uh, it, it took the, the concept of harm in the hate speech clause of the Constitution and basically said that harm means psychological harm and spiritual harm and whatever have you. So basically, if you're offended and you're harmed, then uh, the government can also prohibit uh, people expressing themselves in such a way to harm you. So the courts have been quite uh, uh, reckless in this regard, and uh, it's, it's high time 
for organizations like AfriForum uh, and others to, to really step in and say, listen, up to here and no further. We we do have this constitutional right to freedom of expression. Uh, it, it, it's there for a reason. It's not there for us to discuss the weather or anything. Uh, it's there for us to be able to discuss controversial things, to express mm. controversial expressions, uh, and someone needs to fight for that. Mm. No, absolutely. That's one of the points that I uh, tried to make as often uh, last week when the, the old South African flag was the main uh, story being debated, uh, the ban of the flag, I should rather say specifically. And that is the fact that uh, you don't really get to choose the, the battlefields that you fight for freedom of speech on. Uh, when it comes to the matter of controversy, I'm of the opinion that uh, I'm, I'm yet to see a, a different case that disproves this, but I think uh debates surrounding freedom of speech are inherently controversial it's always going to be about surrounding matters that uh that uh, are associated with offense strong emotions uh even uh psychological trauma it's always those are always inherently going to be part of the debate that makes it very difficult when you uh, are the crusader for freedom of speech uh, because you actually go into this battlefield or into this debate with one arm tied behind your back because in the end, you have to drag the conversation and the audience's attention kicking and screaming into the realm of the abstract, into the bigger picture, uh, while mm. your opponent can just give them a rhetorical red meat by pretty much just saying, well, we, what we have here is clearly a, a debate between good guys and bad guys, people that want to preserve bad things and people that want to ban bad things. On whose side are you really? Um, and you, as the uh, the pro free speech position, have to look at the audience and say, "I know that's a very juicy rhetorical steak that you are being offered, but you need to eat your vegetables as well if you want to have a healthy body." And we're going to have mm -hmm. to uh, take the conversation there. But mm -hmm. yeah, when you, as a South African citizen and as someone that has uh, studied the the constitution here in South Africa, where would you say uh, we are still at a point where we have uh, freedom of speech and freedom of expression? And uh, what would you say, if what were to happen, would you say your opinion would change in that, that regard, whether we have or not? So I would say practically we still do. Um, but the, the flag case specifically um, was a big concern because, uh, funny enough, it seems like the transition period between apartheid and uh, majoritarian democracy uh, there was uh, more, more, more social leeway for freedom there. So it, it was quite common still then for uh, the so-called far right, uh, white South Africans to engage in uh, their advocacy, and uh, they got away with that. Uh, uh, and there was the communists were around, and they're still around, and they said their their drivel, and they got away with that, and they still get away with that. But as the global uh, uh, the, the the global picture has changed as regards mm. freedom of expression, especially in the West, which used to be the uh, the bastion of this this specific liberty. As the picture has changed there, it has changed here as well. So you used to have uh, see in the United States, for instance, the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, would uh, uh, send its Jewish attorneys to defend openly Nazi. American uh, uh, advocates in court and say, listen, this is this is our freedom. It doesn't matter whether it's a Nazi uh, or a fascist expressing it. This is everyone's freedom. And we don't want to see the slippery slope uh, coming our way for things we hold there. Uh, now, that has changed entirely in the last few years, as I think your, your uh, audience will well know and understand. Um, with the rise of call it technocratic socialism or uh, uh, this social justice movement where everything has been dressed up very tightly in, in this moral language of you're on the right side of history or on the wrong side of history, you're good and you're bad, you're evil and you're virtuous. Uh, that has changed in the West drastically and now we have the situation where uh, uh, that has caught up in South Africa. And I think the flag case, the original one, was a very uh, uh, clear indication of this, uh, where where the apart the so-called apartheid flag uh, was legal in South Africa right through the transition uh, up until 2019. It's it's actually ridiculous. Uh, uh, that that would be like uh, the denazification period in Germany 
uh, being less intrusive on the rights of, of fascists than uh, modern day Germany, which is it's, it's a ridiculous notion. But that is what we have. That's what we're seeing. Uh, so we are, I think, on a slippery slope at this stage um, uh, as regards the, the flag case. And there was also a, um, uh, an interesting case, uh, which kind of flips it on its head, but it was, uh, uh, I think it's the Labia case. It was a theater in Cape Town, which uh, refused to show, uh, I think, a Palestinian movie or something in their theater because the owners were... Uh, uh, leaning pro pro Israel, um, and they were taken to the Equality Court, and the Equality Court said, "No, you have to show this. You have to show this material that you disagree with." Now that that is from the other side, uh, a significant infringement of freedom of expression. Uh, Jordan Peterson is well known for for uh, his his uh, advocacy around compelled speech is just as bad as restricted speech. So uh, uh, freedom of expression is, is under attack from both sides, uh, where you are at once prohibited from expressing yourself the way you want to, and also compelled to express yourself in, in a certain specific way. So look, we're, we're still at a stage where I think South African freedom of expression is quite, quite good that you and I can have this conversation without the Gestapo or something kicking down our doors and, and dragging us away, kicking and screaming, is a very good indication that uh, uh, there is still there is still this nice big buffer uh, that exists around freedom of expression. But you cannot deny the fact that we are going da to dangerous places. Um, and I really hope um, that, uh, and, and I have very little trust in our courts, but I do hope that the Supreme Court of Appeal uh, at least sees it this way and that the constitutional court ultimately also sees it this way. Now our courts have been better on freedom of expression than they have been on other things like property rights uh, and, and language rights and so forth. So there is the off chance that the courts may actually come to our rescue and say, listen, uh, it, it's precisely this type of censorship that we try to move away from in 1994 mm. towards a society where everyone, no matter whether they're good guys or bad guys, where everyone feels mm. comfortable expressing themselves uh, without the threat of this violence of the state being imposed upon them just for expressing themselves and not actually committing physical aggression against someone else. Mm. Yeah, Martin, absolutely. And something that uh, that adds to that or something that uh, I just thought about as you uh, were explaining that is the fact that I remember when I was uh, now doing last week, uh, this uh, when I was doing the campaign for the for the court case, I was the spokesperson for Afri Forum. Um, I remember some people told me um, they listened to my interviews. And when I talked about the the old flag just being the first domino uh, and that the government will inherently come for other symbols as well um, and less controversial symbols using the precedent, uh, the legal precedent that is set uh, two things. Firstly, people need to understand uh, how our legal system works. It works, I'm putting this very simply, works through legal precedents. So you use previous court cases to determine or very heavily influence uh, the the, the judgment in future court cases. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how controversial that court case was or how controversial the symbol on trial was. Um, that precedent that is being set with the banning of the old South African flag is, to put it simply, that symbols, when they offend, even when they, uh, even, and I mean, this uh, uh, clearly it does offend people. I'm not going to stand here and deny that uh, people should just. Uh, that that it doesn't cause offense to people i definitely know that and am are aware that that happens but the principle that is being set here is that if symbols offend they can be banned therefore that is the simple legal principle that's being set and many people uh took my argument and they asked me but in good faith uh Ernst, aren't you advert or aren't you using a, a slippery slope fallacy here now this is something that anyone that uh, that go into a first year logic will know is a, a very popular fallacy to reference it's not one that i reference often because i do think there are many cases where there is a slippery slope and that slippery slope is backed up by historical precedents and i think the erosion of freedom is one of the the cases where we actually have a historical precedent all across the world 
of uh, the slippery slope uh, actually happening, where mm. whether that be the erosion of uh, freedom of speech or the erosion erosion of freedom of movement or the erosion mm. of bodily autonomy, these types of uh, freedoms over through his throughout history you can see the slippery slope happen where mm. once a precedent is set uh, that precedent is abused and abused and used again now that's mm. why i wanted to bring this up because i wanted to hear your thoughts i know you're probably very uh, very deeply aware of the the slippery slope fallacy and it's something that's referenced a lot in, in online debates and uh, uh, and more but uh, what are your thoughts on that sentiment i mean like i said this is a real uh, good faith response that i got from many of my listeners mm -hmm. uh they they pretty much out of curiosity asked but isn't does isn't this just the slippery slope argument mm -hmm. that you're making what are your thoughts on that the slippery slope is not a fallacy that is something that has become very clear especially over the last two or three years around the world uh where all of a sudden around the world lockdowns are imposed on 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 a very uh uh simple the historical thought that the government should guarantee public health. Now, I know that people, when that thought was being entrenched, said, listen, if we're going to go with this idea that the government must play a role in public health, it could, it could, it could end badly. And I'm sure people said, ah, slippery slope fallacy. Don't do that. <laughs> the fact is, uh, the slippery slope simply is not a fallacy. Now, there is, there is an error in, in reasoning if, if you, take it in something and say that necessarily now other things will follow on that. That's not the case. Uh, uh, the United States, for instance, has had restrictions on freedom of expression for many years, uh, and those have remained quite constant. The courts haven't expanded those bounds uh, uh, that much. So it, uh, in, in that case, that was not a slippery slope. But you cannot not learn from history. That's that's the one of the, the few things that that history is taught for is that we need to learn these lessons and people are very bad at learning these lessons and it's 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 recent history uh in south africa where we we know what the anc is doing we know what the government is doing we can see it we can see that they are uh, uh victimizing effectively uh people who say that not everything before 1994 was bad now, I am a classical liberal. I think that a hell of a lot of things before 1994 were extremely bad, evil. Um, but it's, it's, it's not true that everything from that period was evil. And it's, in my opinion, not true that the flag only represents apartheid. Uh, the, uh, the United States has had the same flag for its entire history. It just added a few stars. Uh, and black... Uh, uh, Americans who uh, whose ancestors were enslaved now proudly wave that flag uh, because it, it stands for something positive. Now, I'm not saying that the old South African flag must stand for something positive. As you rightly uh, said earlier, it offends many people and, and that's fine. But we know that the ANC's agenda here is not righteous. Uh, they're not trying to protect people's feelings. The ANC government, with its uh, various uh, partners, uh, uh, often dressed in red, uh, is on a very uh, uh, conscious uh, journey towards the restriction of liberty in general. Uh, they find it uh, atrocious that, uh, for instance, that the private sector still has better uh, economic outcomes than the state sector. That's why they have in healthcare, they're going forward with NHI. We see this in every field, and we cannot see that in every field and then ignore it when it comes to freedom of expression. The ANC is a centralist institution that does not abide freedom. When it sees people being free, it, 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 it feels that something isn't right here and it needs to step in. Uh, and that, that applies, unfortunately, to many of the ANC's mm -hmm. uh, uh, judicial officers that they, they tend to appoint. So... Mm -hmm. The slippery slope is not a fallacy. You have to learn from history. You have to especially learn from recent history. You need to see what the government has done in, free, in the, the case of freedom of expression. You need to look at the Equality Act uh, from the year 2000 uh, and see that there already they moved away from the constitutional definition of hate speech. Uh, they made uh, hate speech a broader institution. And, and after that, they even started applying the uh, common law doctrine of criminal area 
to to hate speech cases, which uh, a lot of commenters said, wait, wait a minute, this is not actually what that doctrine is, is meant for. But you have to see these things and understand that this is part of a single scheme, a single scheme of extinguishing freedom of expression, specifically for this minority cultural community. But uh, it doesn't stop there. Uh, anyone who uh, stands in the way of an authoritarian government will uh, will be kicked under the bus. Now, I can guarantee you if, uh, if Afrikaners and uh, uh, other people who are broadly anti, anti the ANC uh, in, in reality were pro ANC and they were just like, oh yeah, rah rah ANC from 1994 up until now, you wouldn't see this. You wouldn't see the, the old flag being banned. Uh, uh, the government is going after its critics. Um, and I, 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 I don't think that's actually very debatable. I think that uh, it's it's so clear that this is a, a concerted effort to, to silence critics uh, piece by piece by piece. Um, uh, eventually, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, Africa, I mean, <laughs> we already see this. Afrikaans is being attacked in, in, mm. in our public schools, for instance. Uh, uh, and it will be attacked in our private schools as well, I can guarantee it. It's all part of the same scheme. So uh, when when people bring up the slippery slope and 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 it's it's understandable that that's that's what we're all taught at university. Uh, uh, we need to remind them that that's that's not how it works. Uh, uh, you cannot say that you cannot appeal to the slippery slope fallacy when what is in fact happening is we're just learning from history and from experience. We're not saying that. It's a slippery slope because something happened and therefore the whole string of other things will happen. Something happened and a bunch of other things will happen because we've seen exactly mm. the, the instigator of that doing these things. And we can, we can see all the linkages. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's important to, to point that out to people. Mm. Yeah, it's. Uh, I just when you were describing that, I had I, I I got this image in my mind. Now I'm not a cartoonist, so I won't be able to draw this for the audience. But I just saw this guy being uh, uh, being attacked by a boa constrictor, and it's tightening around his body, and he's like, "This this snake is uh, is tightening uh, its body, and it's constricting me." And then someone just screams at him, "Slippery slope <laughs> fallacy!" <laughs> <laughs> and like, yeah, exactly. that's what the government does i mean south mm. africa is such a good case study i always ask people to do a little thought experiment i ask them genuine question take the last uh 28 years of anc rule in south africa can you name one instance of the anc passing a bill or enacting a policy or uh, approving a piece of legislation that takes away power from the government and i'm not talking about when they're forced to do it by a court or when they're forced to do it out of just sheer loss of capacity i'm talking about out of their own free will they're doing it out of a commitment to decentralization and providing more freedom to the citizens you can't name me one example of of that ever happening in their 28 year existence as the ruling party in south africa and that should show you why they are the the uh, ANC government in South Africa is that boa constrictor just waiting for you to uh, uh, I mean I'm a, many of my most of my audience will know how it works when a, when that constrictor snake is around a, a mammal it waits until the mammal exhales and then it goes tighter and I mean that's exactly mm. what the government does to your rights mm. it just waits mm. for you uh, to slip up a little bit and uh, allowing the old South African flag to be banned is uh, a slip up in my opinion from uh, the the larger pub the public at large because it is mm. from complacency that this type mm. of thing happens I, I used the metaphor before we uh, went live that it's pretty much just fish uh, not knowing the value of the water that they swim in and mm. that's the thing about freedom of speech is that you only realize what you had when it's gone because it enables mm. all your other rights to be defended it gives you the mm -hmm. opportunity to open your mouth when other, your other rights are being restricted of course the mm. ANC is then or any tyrannical government for that matter will target freedom of speech the most viciously because they know when that's out of the way um, they can pretty much just chip away all your other rights because you won't your your mouth will be shut and you won't even be able to make a noise about the mm. fact uh, about what they're doing. You will literally be, sit there watching as they're doing it, and you can't even warn the people around you, uh, mm. to put it very simply, or to sketch it in a simple way like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and we see it with with all uh, uh, first generational uh, rights, uh, privacy, property. 
uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a single scheme. Uh, when when people when when the right to privacy is being invaded, people are like, ah, but if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. No, mm. no, 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 no. That's that's not how it works. Uh, if you have nothing to hide, you have everything to fear. So you should always stand up for that right. Uh, and and the, as you rightly say, the ANC since 1994, with interesting exceptions, have have never limited their own power, uh, uh, but they have expanded. Uh, uh, rights in 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 I guess in some of the most perverse ways. Uh, uh, so even when it comes to uh, the right to information, access to information, it's not like the Promotion of Access to Information Act uh, is as generous as the right to access to information in the Constitution. They ex mm. they exclude cabinet privilege and so forth. But when it comes to property rights, then they say, ah. Oh, but we're legislating to expand property rights to everyone uh, by passing uh, ESTA and, and, and these uh, laws that effectively allow squatting and, and, and so yeah. forth. And they act like, yeah, we're, we're actually favoring the rights here. But the way that the ANC expanded those rights is by giving the government more power. So it's, mm. uh, it's, it's a philosophical error that, um, that you'll definitely be familiar with, and that is that all rights are just the same. We have uh, uh, the right to freedom of expression is the same as the right to housing and for the world. That's not the case. Mm. These are these are different things that have been meshed together in the Bill of Rights, and uh, the confusion that that creates has really enabled the government to to violate the classical rights like freedom of expression, property, privacy. Uh, while expanding these pretenders uh, of rights, and then allow that allows the government to say, "Oh no, but you can't say we only we only restrict rights." Then be silly. Look, look at how we're we're building houses and so forth. So uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it's a far more fundamental problem. People need to be able to distinguish uh, the things that they're dealing with here, and then always the classical rights will always be the foundation of a of a free and a prosperous society. Uh, so people must always have their eyes closely on the ball when it comes to freedom of expression, property rights, uh, privacy, uh, uh, and so forth. Mm. No, absolutely. And where you said the, uh, some rights are more important than others, it's, it almost comes back to those those Greek virtues where some virtues enable the other ones. I remember mm. um, one of my philosophy professors used to ask the class, like, what which virtue is the most important? And the, I always thought the the best answer was always courage because courage enables the other the other virtues you can't uh stand up for justice for the virtue of justice if you don't have courage you can't have mm. moderation if you don't have courage to stand up to your 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 uh, almost like animal urges or your your more sinful behavior or your sinful nature mm. So when it comes to these types of, uh, the, to, to your rights, uh, your right to freedom of speech enables you to actually uh, protect the other rights and you can't stand up uh, for them without it. Now, while we're on specifically this, uh, this topic of uh, why it's important to have freedom of expression, uh, are there other angles to why this is an important right that we haven't touched on that you'd uh, that you'd like to to focus the audience's attention on specifically why it's so critical to protect and stand up for freedom of expression even though uh, it is often or as I say always uh, controversial and and you are in the minority when it comes to popularity. Hmm. Yeah, no, look, that's that's I think the most crucial insight. So freedom of expression is always going to be controversial. Uh, because someone is always going to be offended by something that someone else says. Uh, even even some of the most innocuous things, if you comment on the weather, there is someone out there who will be offended by you commenting on the weather. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the larger the group of potential offendees becomes, the easier it is to, to uh, ban that type of expression. And that's why it's so dangerous. Uh, to allow that, and that is why freedom of expression is elevated to a to a constitutional status. Uh, uh, that is why this trend has happened all around the world. Uh, it was in the recognition, I think, probably started with the Americans, um, but but I think there may be one or two examples before that, where people said, "Listen, uh, it is a slippery slope if we start uh, banning types of expression that that some of the most uncontroversial things that we say." will be banned and it's it's not there to protect uh, us saying uncontroversial things it's not there to allow us to praise the government 
I don't think the government would care. Uh, that's not an instance of freedom of expression necessarily. Freedom of expression is when you say something that out of a very passionate uh, uh, desire people would want to see squashed and, and banned. That is why that right exists. Um, now, I think that's that's probably the, the most important angle. But I mean, uh, freedom of expression, as you just alluded to with uh, uh, the most important virtues, Freedom of expression underlies uh, uh, a lot of uh, constitutionalism itself. Uh, you can't you can't have a pretension to a democracy, for instance, without freedom of expression. I mean, you can have these elections and so forth every five years, but if you're not allowed to campaign, if you're not allowed to uh, convince people that your party or candidate is the one to vote for, uh, then that democracy is is paper thin. Um, and I, I would argue that property rights is also one of those underlying guarantees of democracy. All the all the civil uh, classical rights, I would say, are. Um, so yeah, it's it's crucial for democracy. Uh, so that's that's one angle. It's not it's not just about the individual's liberty. Uh, that's the most important thing I would argue as a classical liberal. But one of the uh, uh, significant other uh, communitarian almost angles is that it's it's a collective benefit it's mm -hmm. it uh, freedom of expression guarantees that we have this framework this democratic framework uh, that allows us to change governments that allows us to call out tyranny uh, when it comes about and allows us uh, everyone not not just minorities allows majorities even to uh, to to put uh, injustice to an end through advocacy through through campaigning mm -hmm. Uh, um, and then, of course, the Constitution itself uh, also points out the other angles, the uh, academic freedom. Without academic freedom, which is something that the previous version of the aid speech bill would have also uh, harmed significantly, you can't have uh, a scientific inquiry to, to its fullest extent. That, that mm. retards human progress. So, um, and of course, the press media, uh, uh, the press in South Africa has become really, really shit uh, over the last few years. But it's still a fundamental... And cheering on their own muzzlement or cheering yes. at their own demise. <laughs> yeah, when I see journalists uh, uh, saying, let's let's adopt the hate speech bill or something, I'm like, what? What is this? No, that's not, it's, it's incredible. But but it's it's so important to have a free press that is actually allowed to, to point out anything. Uh, that uh, especially relating to the abuse of power by government. So that's another angle. It, it, it's, it's, it's about information. It's about us knowing what is happening uh, behind the scenes where the powerful would rather not have us seen. So freedom of expression is really is a multifaceted uh, institution. And if you chip away at its, at its foundation, um, your, the whole thing can come crumbling down, as you rightly said about precedent. It, it, it's, uh, the battle should be won at the first step because then you can have a principled argument. But if you allow various precedents to be set, then it, it just becomes a case of your opponent is going to say, well, you want to you uh, rehash an old debate that's already been had. The fact mm -hmm. is freedom of expression is restricted. And, and I've had this argument many times, uh, especially about markets uh, and, and economies. People are like, no, but Martin, there is no free market in the world. There is no absolutely free market in the world. So why are you trying to rehash this debate? Let's have another regulation here. Let's have expropriation there. Uh, the, there is no point in trying to rehash that debate. And the same applies to freedom of expression. Uh, we are now in a very difficult position, especially you uh, as Afri Forum, where you have to say, but listen, this is a principled matter. Uh, uh, regardless of what the courts have said in the past, the fact is uh, there is a, a fundamental, fundamentally important constitutional right and liberty here that must be protected. And we don't want the precedents to get any worse than they already are. So, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 not an easy game. And if you allow precedents to be set against freedom, uh, you you make you make it far more difficult for yourself going forward. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you mentioned there that freedom of speech is not just there to protect the individual. I mean, it was M.P. van Wyk Lowe that said um, the, the free exchange of ideas is the fresh air that a, a community or society can't survive without. And uh, mm. that's exactly what, uh, well, that's exactly the point. So let's move on. Now that you've mentioned the, the flag case, I'd like to discuss that before we, uh, before we get to the uh, uh, prevention of hate crimes and combating of hate crimes uh, uh, speech bill. 
Um, so firstly, you wrote a piece uh, back in 2019 when the old South African flag was on the chopping block for the first time. Uh, you, it's titled Don't Make the Old Flag a Martyr for Freedom. Uh, let's start off with that with that piece. What was your angle specifically for people that haven't read it? Before you, uh, before you answer, there is a link in the description to uh, Martin's piece if you want to go read it for yourself in detail. Uh, of, of course, we don't have time for, uh, for Martin to give us the entire piece or to recite it. Uh, but yeah, anyway, give us uh, give us the essence of what your, your uh, take there was on the old flag and then we can go from there. So the reason I, I wrote that article was because when I saw the heat being placed on the old flag, I almost I saw myself basically in the position that you are now. And mm -hmm. that is that uh, I do not want to be the defender of the old flag. That's not a position that I want to be in. As a classical liberal, uh, uh, much of what the old flag stood for revolts me. It revolts my most basic political instincts. Um, and if this were 1960, I would be in the camp against the government represented by that flag. Uh, but when people start saying, no, 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 we're, we're offended, we're going to ban this flag, then I'm like, no, but wait a second. The way I interpret the, the struggle against apartheid, uh, at least in large part, was that it, it, it sought to establish a society where, where, where everyone is free to, to make these decisions for themselves. That is what I would have been fighting against had I been there. That is why I would have been opposed to the, the government represented by the old flag. That, that would have been the whole point. But now uh, we want to say, no, but let's, let's ban the old flag. Let's use the exact same logic, the exact same authoritarian principles that the old government used and use that against peaceful individuals who are expressing themselves in a in a, a mildly offensive way today that is that's 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 not how uh, that's not how you honor the struggle against apartheid if if you wish to honor it uh, and and i i i found myself thinking geez if they ban this flag i'm going to have to say no we we can't do that and i'm going to have to hold the old flag and say i'm making a statement I have the old flag here, and I insist that I must be allowed to have the old flag here and to wave it around. I insist, uh, and and I don't, I didn't want to be in that position. You, did, you clearly don't want to be in that position. But here we are. Mm. We are in that position now. They have made the old flag a martyr for freedom. It is now a symbol of expression being censored, uh, and and that's that's disgusting. Why why would the courts do that? Why would the courts blow so much life into this this uh, this cloth that they find revolting? They have given mm. it so much more legitimacy now by by in, in the act of banning it. And yes, people are gonna say, "Oh, Martin, I got you." Do you think that the swastika should also be able to be uh, waved in Germany and in Israel? Yes, 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 it should. Of course it should. Uh, I, I don't care that the Germans banned it. I don't care that the, the Israelis banned it. I'm, I'm very pro-Israel uh, in, in that whole debate. But the fact is, freedom of expression, uh, we, we've had this discussion now. It's, it's, it is a slippery slope if you start chipping away at it. You have to guard it jealously. And when your, when your worst enemy, effectively, is being deprived of his freedom of expression, you need to step in and say, okay, let's, our disagreement is now on hold. I am going to uh, uh, stand with you and say, no, you're not going to censor this. Uh, uh, and and uh, a lot of people would say, oh, but Afriform is trying to, to get uh, Julius Malema imprisoned or whatever for singing uh, Kill the Boer. And it's like, that's, that's totally different. That's a, threat, that's a threat of force. That's a threat of force. It's a categorical difference. Uh, holding, holding. If if the old flag said uh, had written on it, let's kill black people. Yes, of course, it's a threat of force. It doesn't say that. It also doesn't imply that. Uh, but so there's a categorical difference between uh, censoring or banning uh, expression that incites violence or threatens violence, and and uh, simply banning expression that that is offensive. And it's 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 easy to make this distinction. It's not a blurred line. Uh, so. Uh, 
yeah, the, the, that was my thinking when I when I wrote the article. It's that there is a there is a legitimate scope of government regulation of of expression, and it's very small. It is only to do with coercion and threats thereof. But now the government is stepping out of that, banning something that many people find revolting, which I don't particularly enjoy. But now I am forced into the position of saying, no, you may not. And I will insist that I will be able to wave that flag. So that was my thinking. It's uh, the government and the courts have, have placed us in this position, which uh, I, I really hoped that they wouldn't. Uh, but but as I said earlier, hopefully there is more sanity in the SCA and the Constitutional Court, and hopefully they can reverse that so that we don't have to be seen as the poster boys for the old flag, because I don't think either of us want want to do that. So. Hmm. No, absolutely, Martin, I, and that's why I invited you on for this conversation, because uh, you definitely, uh, are, as one of the commenters pointed out, and as I said at the outset of this conversation, uh, absolutely a principled person when it comes to these types of matters. A sideliner opinion said, uh, in reality, there are very few classical liberals like you, Martin. Those so-called anti-apartheid liberals now turn out to be true illiberal authoritarians. And actually, that comment brings me to one of the questions that I that I wanted to ask you because seeing as I was the spokesperson for Afri Forum last week on this uh, this flag uh, debate um, Afri Forum's members completely understand what Afri Forum's stance here is we didn't get a member backlash as a lot of people or maybe the the big media uh, media line was there's this massive backlash yeah online from people that don't understand uh, the value of freedom of speech, but our members understand completely what we were doing. We had massive support from them in our case. Um, I mean, I was the guy whose uh, uh, email was out there as if you have any questions about Afri Forum stances, please send your queries to this email. I think I have a good idea, my finger on the pulse of what the public thought. Um, mm. So here's my question then, and it, it stems from something that someone said in chat. Um, as Afri Forum were fighting for this appeal of the ban of the old South African flag last week, Afri Forum stood relatively alone. There were many figures like you and Sikhle Ngobise, um, Richard Wilkinson uh, that I remember, and uh, probably more that I didn't see, but uh, they were a vast minority. Uh, Afri Forum stood relatively alone in this fight for freedom of speech, and Afri Forum isn't even an uh, ideologically devout classical liberal uh, organization, but we stood up for the principle. Now, my question for you is, as someone that uh, sees himself as a classical liberal, what what happened? Uh, why did the liberals in, in freedom of speech's most dire hour, where the precedent for its demise was set, uh, why did they shirk their responsibility? Why did they stand back? Why did they either mm. take one of two options in the majority? Either mm. stood silently and didn't say anything, or actually took part in the almost the, the calls for blood and saying, no, this this flag needs to be banned uh, for the mm. greater good of everyone. What is your diagnosis? What happened? Yeah, look, so a lot of people in South Africa uh, call themselves liberals. And it's interesting. So something happened in the 1980s. It's called the liberal slide away. Uh, yes. And that it's it's not like it's not like you can say that's the clear breaking point. There's a whole context of what happened with American liberalism and to an extent the French Revolution and so forth. Um, uh, there there is a, conti a continuum from what one would describe as Lockean uh, classical liberalism, which is very principled, uh, which I I consider myself as, uh, and what today generally passes for liberal is now the liberal slide away effectively. Uh, was a, a situation where people who, many of whom were good classical liberals, now saw the ANC uh, uh, starting the armed struggle uh, effectively. And they, when, 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 when some of them criticized the armed struggle, some of them stood back a bit and thought, wait a minute, don't they actually have some, in, some inherent right to to inflict violence even upon civilians that that they would be above criticism and that that was effectively the the motivating uh, point of the liberal slide away because it, it it occurred in this western adoption of of uh, specifically the concept of white privilege um and and uh, that's just the the idea that racism is a systemic uh, uh, amorphous institution that surrounds us rather than identifiable instances 
uh, and a lot of these liberals who unfortunately for me <laughs> uh, continued calling themselves liberals uh, uh, they effectively said no you uh, uh, capitalism, uh, freedom of expression, all these things are in fact part of a, a superstructure that upholds white supremacy. Uh, uh, and and today, uh, uh, many people in South Africa who call themselves liberals are slide away liberals, and they would uh, uh, firmly find themselves uh, in favor of banning the old flag because of what it apparent the, the the subtext the the apparent representation of violence against against black south africans so they would rationalize it in that way uh while calling themselves liberals which is uh, well we, i mean i'm i'm a dictionary guy if you just look at liberal liber liberty like j just call yourself something else my goodness <laughs> but then there are uh there are uh, uh classical liberals who also uh, didn't engage in this and uh, I guess it 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 comes down to um, could it be ex exhaustion, <laughs> uh, and and uh, you you made the point earlier, which I think is important. And uh, uh, many people would say this is not the hill to die upon. Uh, many classical liberals would say that there are more important hills to die upon. And well, maybe there are. Um, but uh, speaking uh, speaking uh, metaphorically, I think we can die on many hills, and we should die on many hills. And I think uh, freedom of expression is certainly uh, a hill to die upon. But there is no use in us uh, protecting private property rights successfully when uh, uh, there on the other side, freedom of expression has been destroyed. Uh, that would be an incomplete freedom that at the end of the day, it, it, it would just put us in the exact position we would have been anyway. So yeah, a lot of people uh, think that there are better things to spend their time on. Uh, a lot of classical liberals would say that about this case. And then I disagree. I, I think that uh, we are duty bound to uh, to focus on all of these things. Uh, and I think freedom of expression as represented by, in South Africa's context, the most offensive symbol, the old flag, I think that is certainly a hill that, that classical liberals absolutely should go die on uh, and uh, at, at the same time we really really need to uh, take our word back uh, liberal is not their word they're social democrats they're progressives some of them are simply communists i don't know why they have this this affinity for this term that refers to individual liberty and property rights and li constitutionally limited government so mm. that that still baffles me but uh, it's it's a work in progress mm. Yeah, and uh, as I said at the onset of uh, of this conversation, uh, uh, we're here for a for a principal conversation. If you want to see me uh, oh, debate Martin, uh, you can go find a, a link to that in the description uh, on many of these matters uh, that uh, are addressed in the comment section, or that uh, that you're bringing up in the in the in the live chat. Now, Martin, something that I wanted to cover before we say goodbye or get into final thoughts is the prevention and combating of hate crimes and hate speech bill. Now, this is a bill that's uh, appeared before parliament it failed they tried again uh, there has been a comment period uh every forum did submit a written submission now we uh, are again uh, uh in 2021 we submitted another written submission and wednesday uh tomorrow we are doing our oral presentations i'm actually doing the oral presentation before the parliamentary committee so uh, tonight's conversation will actually serve as prep for tomorrow because they're going to be asking me a lot of questions and they're asking me whether i have a soul or not now when it comes to this type of uh, this bill again um and i know you are you are familiar with it uh, is this pretty much uh, from your perspective the same the same assault just from a different angle with a different type of uh, weapon uh, whereas the banning of the flag is a sword this is just a spear coming from a different angle but all towards the same target and that target being uh, freedom of expression in south africa absolutely yeah so uh, you have to look at the history of the bill to see what their actual intention is with it uh, and that's what I think they will still work up towards. And the, the original 2016 version of the bill effectively said that if you insult or ridicule someone, you can go to jail for three years as a first offense and up to five years as a second offense uh, and then fines and so forth. So effectively, it, it outlawed all freedom of expression. The first uh, hate speech bill basically said that if someone's even remotely offended or insulted by something you've done or said, you're going to jail, done. Uh, 
Uh, now, thankfully, that was one of the uh, few examples where even the left uh, authoritarian leftists said, whoa, okay, dude, this is this is going a little bit too far, guys. Let's take a step back. So it was so universally reviled that uh, we now have this new version of the bill, which, I mean, it's not bad. Uh, it, it comes quite close to what the Constitution allows, uh, uh, with a few exceptions. Um, uh, uh, the Constitution says that the government may prohibit advocacy of hatred, advocacy of hatred. Mm. Uh, this bill says that communication of hatred may, may also be uh, prohibited. So that's that's unacceptable. Uh, there's there's definitely a difference between say, expressing an opinion and advocating for something. Um, and the other thing is the Constitution has only four protected grounds, race, ethnicity, gender, and religion. Uh, and the hate speech bill has 15. Uh, which I think includes something like belief and culture. So uh, if, if you advocate hate, if you communicate hatred for some cultural practice, let's say initiation schools or, uh, or something like that, then theoretically you're engaged in hate speech. Uh, so this bill is, is still very problematic. Um, All it's, on, it's the, on the grounds of age, if you call someone an old fool, uh, yes. you, will be, uh, you will pretty much be guilty of hate speech. Yeah, yeah, and occupation as well. If you criticize mm. uh, politicians or lawyers, that's hate speech. Uh, it's a protected. <laughs> no group. more, no more lawyer jokes. No more journalist no. jokes. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, at least as a lawyer, I'll be, I'll be safe. Then I feel, <laughs> I feel so good. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a problem. It's a problematic bill. It's not nearly as bad as the first one, but it's still something that must absolutely be resisted. And the way that uh, uh, I've approached it in my comments on the bill is to say, listen, the Constitution provides a definition of hate speech. All you need to do is highlight, copy, paste. You don't have to be innovative. Just take the constitutional definition of hate speech and use that. But uh, the first prize is leave it alone. Just hmm. don't get into it. Just leave it alone. Uh, there are already doctrines that deal with with expression that is truly harmful, like criminal urea when used appropriately. Um, other legislation already prohibits uh, I think unconstitutionally, but nonetheless already prohibits certain types of expression. The Films and Publications Act prohibits uh, hate speech. The Equality Act prohibits hate speech. So why why are we adding more uh, more nonsense onto the already heavily loaded unconstitutionality train? Uh, so yeah, it's it's as you say. It's just another way for the government to uh, undermine freedom of expression. That is the only agenda here. Um, uh, it, it, it's probably the, the government trying to take ownership of, of the, the field from the courts. Uh, the, even though the courts share an ideological spectrum with the government, uh, the government is still very jealous of its leading role and, and it would not want to be outdone by its comrades on the bench. So it, it's still persevering with the, uh, the hate speech bill. So yeah, it, it must be fought, it must be defeated. Um, and I, I, I think that it will probably, if it's adopted into law, I think it will probably uh, fail when it's challenged on its constitutionality because the definition simply does not gel with what the constitution allows. So I am not too worried uh, uh, if we assume that uh, the, the, the courts don't, wouldn't want to be too obviously uh, 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 anti-constitutional. Um, so I, I'm not too worried about that. So my, my concern is definitely far more the flag case, um, because there we already have the saints, the saints who occupy the benches, who have now ordained that uh, the, the flag is hate speech. That is dangerous, uh, because everyone already agrees, yeah, the ANC and Parliament, they're a bunch of nincompoops. Uh, but when it's the saints on the bench, then, then it's a different story. So there's a far, it's, it's the, 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 fl the banning of the old flag via judicial means is a far more respectable thing. And for that reason, is far more dangerous than a bunch of clown politicians trying to adopt a blatantly unconstitutional law. But yes, we need to fight both. Absolutely. Hmm. Well, Martin, uh, thank you very much. I don't really have anything to add there. What I will add is that uh, if you want to hear my thoughts, seeing as we are almost out of time, 
uh, just uh, keep an eye on my channel tomorrow. Uh, I will be uploading my uh, presentation before the, the parliamentary committee here on this channel as well. So just keep an eye on your subscription box if you want to hear my thoughts uh, to add to what Martin has said. But I think you summed it up uh, very, very well. Now, before we get into final thoughts and uh, uh, before we say goodbye, I would just like to again uh, use this opportunity to thank uh, the sponsor that's been sponsoring the show for a very long time, and that is Bidvice, who is the only place in South Africa that sells uh, Bitcoin directly to your self-custody, meaning that unlike a traditional crypto exchange, you don't have to trust anyone to hold your Bitcoin for you. Uh, this removes the largest risk associated with Bitcoin. And if you're interested in crypto, specifically what's been happening in the crypto world recently, uh, you can check out uh, the podcast called By the Horns, which is available on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. You can also go to their website. There's a link in the description. Uh, and you can send them uh, questions and ask them uh, all your questions regarding crypto and Bitcoin. They're very helpful and they are, are, are there to, to give you the insights that you need. So specifically, if you're curious, uh, even if you're not uh, at this moment thinking about getting into crypto, you can just send them your questions and they will be able to help you out. Um, so yeah, uh, go check out their website. If you are interested in, uh, in, uh, getting into crypto, they will be able to help you. So, uh, while, while their service is only for South Africans, they've been hard at work at making, uh, some changes to their product over the past few months. You may remember that their minimum purchase size was 20,000 Rand, but, uh, it has been reduced to 5,000 Rand recently, and you can now buy Bitcoin directly to your hardware wallet in a matter of seconds through them. So, uh, if you are interested in uh, getting into that, that sphere, uh, click the link in the description, go check it out. Or even if you just want to go ask them a question now. Martin, to to get to the final thoughts on uh, tonight's topic, if you seeing it's it's only uh, Tuesday now, but let's uh, let's give the the audience something to think about, something to chew on as the week progresses. What would you leave them with? Uh, maybe not to to uh, think about or lay awake at night uh, tonight about, but maybe something to just chew on a little bit uh, in the week ahead uh, regarding uh, tonight's topic. Hmm. Yeah, the, the thing I always uh, go back to at the end of discussions like this, which tend to be very uh, pessimistic and negative and, and doomsday, is that uh, freedom is always just within grasp. Uh, you've seen it uh, with many societies around the world. Um, uh, Germany and Japan are, are very good exa recent examples where within a few short years after a period of intense totalitarianism, intense uh, authoritarianism and intense economic devastation, uh, they were able to just turn it around in, in almost the blink of an eye and become some of the most prosperous, some of the most free states in the world. So never despair. Don't ever become a defeatist and think, oh, the ANC is taking us on from all, all sides. We're just going to lose. Uh, my goodness, what will, what can we do? Nah. Uh, I think AfriForum has, has identified uh, the, the reality already, and that is the state is failing. It can't help but fail. Uh, and it is providing institutions uh, uh, where, where vacuums uh, exist. Uh, and other organizations are also starting to come to this realization and also starting to create institutions to, to the point where at some point it might not even matter if the courts ban the old flag or ban anything. Uh, people just say, well, uh, <laughs> come and enforce it then. Uh, you can't because the police have been gutted. Uh, so don't, don't despair. Um, there are many, many ways to, to kill a cat. Uh, there are many avenues to freedom, um, some easier than others, some some quite complicated. Uh, but but never think that it's it's an entirely hopeless situation. That's simply not the case. That will ne never be the case. It doesn't matter how much damage the ANC does. Uh, if if enough people, and it doesn't have to be a majority of people, it could be a, a very active minority. If enough of us just say, well, listen, we we want freedom, and we we just take it. And it's ours. It's there. It's there for the taking. So don't despair. Keep your chins up. Um, uh, there's always there's always another way to to secure prosperity and freedom. Uh, and uh, it's it's never hopeless. Hmm. 
Well, Martin, uh, I'm very glad you ended on a white pill because uh, this is a very black pilling conversation. Uh, sometimes when it comes to freedom of speech, people get very, uh, <laughs> very hopeless. But as I always say on this show, uh, if the situation was truly hopeless, our opponent's uh, propaganda would be unnecessary. So just keep that in mind. Exactly. Um, but anyway, Martin, thank you very much for sharing your insights. I know you are a, a scholar in, in this regard. You have a lot of knowledge to share. And that's why I thought you'd be, a, I was going to just talk about this topic on my own tonight on the show. And I thought, well, uh, you'd definitely be a good guest to have on to also uh, give a, a thorough overview of it. So thank you very much. And then I would just like to give you the final opportunity to uh, show your content, let people know where they can read uh, what you write and where can they find your latest ideas. Absolutely. Yeah. And thanks for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure. Um, my, uh, my website is the main port of call. So that's uh, martinvanstaden.com. Uh, I'm also on, uh, on Facebook. That's facebook.com forward slash martinvanstadenliberty, all one word. And I'm also uh, on Twitter. That is uh, twitter.com forward slash martin underscore ASFL. Uh, and you can find all of my writing, um, all of my uh, podcast appearances, all of my television appearances, all of that is on my website. So uh, when in doubt, just uh, have a look at my website. And again, Ernst, thanks. That's uh, This has been a great conversation. Hmm. Well, perfect. And then I'd also just like to use this opportunity to thank everyone that tuned in. Thank you very much uh, for all your great questions and comments. Uh, you always add to the content. Uh, sometimes, as I always say, I get a bit distracted by the chat because it's just so interesting to read what you guys have to say. You really are um, uh, all very valuable to the conversation. And then uh, I would just like to lastly say, if you're new to this channel and you like these types of conversations, you can leave a like, or if you're new, you can uh, subscribe for more of these types of conversations. If you are uh, regular or just new, you can leave a like as well. That helps out the show. And if you're watching live or if you're not watching live and the show is done, I know some of you only watch this afterwards, or most of you actually watch this afterwards because you're very busy. Um, you can leave your thoughts in the comments. Uh, so unfortunately, you can't take part in the live chat anymore, but you can still leave your thoughts in the comments section. I read all of them and uh, reply to as many as possible. And I see my power just went on. So that's excellent timing. All right. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. And God bless.